Norman Greenbaum, a very happy birthday to you. Oh, thanks so much. It's so nice to catch up with you. It's been a long time since we've heard or read anything much about you. You're going to have to catch us up with your life. You're looking very well. I've been a good boy. <laughs> well, that's a good, good way to be. You have come back to performing recently, and I also read of you that you actually manage other bands and, and promote concerts yourself. Oh, that was a long time ago. Ah. Now we, we had put a, a new band together and uh, we were all set to start playing. We had some things lined up, but then the virus got out of hand and we couldn't rehearse and they had to cancel all the, all the get togethers and shows. And uh, yeah, so. <laughs> so how have you been, what have you been kind doing during? Down, yeah, I'm sure. What have you been doing during this time? Not much. <laughs> Have you discovered any new hobbies or, or activities? Well, we, we have a, a, a vegetable garden and a greenhouse. So we spent uh, a lot of, a lot of it, uh, the day uh, growing some things. And uh, we still sing just for ourselves and watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. You say we still sing for ourselves. You're talking about yourself and Benita. Yeah, and Benita sings and she's part of the band. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And Benita is your wife? Yeah. Oh, how long have you two been married? Well, we're not married, but we... You're long-term, you're not life officially, partners. Not officially. <laughs> easier to say and makes a lot more sure, sense. Sure, sure, We've been sure. together almost 10 years. Oh, that's so nice. Um, I was reading about your history and it's quite fascinating. Where you are today is vastly different from where you started out, isn't it? Well, do you, do you mean where I started with music? I, I actually mean growing up in an Orthodox Jewish household in Massachusetts and going to college oh, okay. and doing all of that. I can imagine your choice of becoming a musician wouldn't have been met with too much pleasure from your family. Well, that's absolutely true. Um, it wasn't a total, total religious house. Uh, there were some exceptions made. Uh, but in, I, I went to Hebrew school and, and followed most of the rules. And uh, there was a large Jewish community in, in the city I grew up in. But I, I had an affinity towards music. And I got a guitar when I was in junior high and taught myself to play. And then when I started college in Boston, I lived uh, near what they called back then coffee house clubs. And they did not, not serve alcohol. It, w it was like a Starbucks with uh, music. It's a great and concept. So I, started, I started singing there, and that's where I made the decision that that's what I wanted to do. And I, I had, I liked writing lyrics, so that came to me quite easy. And uh, I was sort of goofy because I grew up with a lot of, there were a lot of goofy records back then in the early, late 50s and early 60s when I was a teenager. And so that it always and and the uh, the uh, movies that were about out of space out of space and, and things. So that kind of stayed in the back of my mind, and I started writing songs. And I didn't want to. Uh, the music scene in Boston didn't have the big record companies or anything, and I didn't really like New York. So uh, I had a friend that had gone to Los Angeles, and he says, "You got to come out here." And I said, uh, I sure can. I, I listened to all the Beach Boys songs. <laughs> I want to be there. And so I did. And I moved to, <clears throat> I moved to Hollywood. And, uh, you know, you start hanging around and you find out where, where the music is. And you start going there and you meet people. And so I put the word out that I wanted to start a jug band because, uh, that was my favorite music in uh, in college. And uh, there were uh, people that were bringing the old guys back to do the college 
folk circuit who, okay. who were from the 30s and they still uh, were able to play. Right. And I went, boy, I, lo I love this kind of music. So uh, I met some people and we started a jug band. Okay. And we called it uh, Dr. West's Medicine Show and Junk Band. And uh, well, to go back to the religious part of my life, uh, that kind of ended when I started college and just wanted to put that aside and uh, not follow through. Uh, a lot of people were doing that. They were just looking for careers that it didn't fit in with. And so I started a jug band and uh, we knew someone. He says, you know, you guys are real different. I know, I know a manager. He might like you. So we all went to his office and, and we were kind of an odd band. We were all acoustic, but we painted our faces long before of Kiss <laughs> and we had a light show. So uh, they loved, he loved us. The managers, there were two. Uh, they absolutely said, you guys are different enough for me to sign. And so we got a record deal and that's when we recorded our first song which going back to the outer space thing was called the egg plant that ate Chicago. <laughs> yeah. And uh, well, I don't think it did much anywhere else. I'm not even sure it got released elsewhere, but we did make it to 50 on the charts. Wow. The that's charts. amazing. And so we, we went on tour and we did a lot of clubs. And so we did that for a couple of years. And, but, uh, I got tired of doing it. Uh, a lot of it didn't go over well because I had a strange sense of humor. <laughs> and uh, we weren't a crazy band. We didn't break things. But we did have a song where the uh, um, the drummer had, had a, a, an alternative drum set made out of galvanized uh, garbage cans. <laughs> And so uh, he did the one song I wrote for him, which was called uh, Don't Eat the Monkey's Peanuts, Joe. Because uh, <laughs> you really did if, have a very if, strange if, if sense of humor. If the monkey humor. didn't eat, he wouldn't have a, 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 a cage to clean. And um, that was his second job because we didn't make much money in those days. And he got very, very furious on stage. And he lit. He lit the galvanized uh, garbage cans on fire with this little bit of fire. It wasn't much, but it made everybody nervous. And they, they started to think I was just a nut. <laughs> so I said, you know, maybe I'll just do something else. So I left that behind and uh, I got some other people together and we got into rock and roll. Okay. And so uh, we were playing here and there. And uh, one night at the Troubadour, uh, a producer happened to be there, uh, Eric Jacobson, and he had been the producer of all the Love and Spoonful hits, right. uh, which there were about eight or 10. Yep, and yes. so he was uh, very, very, very well known. And he, li he liked what I was doing. And he said, uh, you know, he'd be in touch. Let's get together and listen to some of your other songs and see what you got. Right. And so I did that and he liked it enough to sign me because he had an open uh, production deal with Warner Brothers. So I did that and I moved to Northern California because he was based in San Francisco and uh, we started recording. But I had to leave the band behind. So it was just you who we lots, wanted. Yeah. And... Uh, he knew lots of people from producing other records right. uh, in San Francisco with, with bands from there. So uh, we had uh, plenty of people that could do studio work to choose from. And I had been working on the music for Spirit in the Sky quite a long time. And so I had the music, didn't quite know what to do with it. But while I was in LA, I used to listen, uh, listen to the uh, watch actually it was on TV, the Porter Wagoner show, and he was a very famous uh, country singer. And uh, in fact, he was the one that discovered Dolly Parton. So, uh, I, and he always did 
uh, a gospel song about halfway through his show. Okay. And you know where my mind is, I'm going, I've never done that. Maybe I could do that. He's doing good with it. So, so I sat down, I wrote lyrics. I go, you know, you got to have a friend in Jesus. And it, it had nothing to do with my religious background. At that point, I'm writing songs. And uh, my take on that was, if you're a songwriter, you can write about anything. You, you make things up. They don't all have to be necessarily true. They just have to go over and people have to recognize it. Because a lot of people wrote for TV and they, they weren't part yeah. of, of the people that it was about, like like Sanford and Son and stuff. Yeah, but uh, so I said, here I got two things. One, I got this music with this lick. Uh, and then I got these lyrics. I said, this is it. I'll put them together. Did and you that's know how it came about. Did you know at the time that the music, that the licks that you did have were so special? Did you have a feeling about how good they were before you put the lyrics onto them? Oh, I did. And uh, I mean, we weren't performing it because I didn't have the lyrics. But uh, it was an, a unique song <clears throat> with the guitar part that I played. <clears throat> and uh, it was very memorable. It was indeed very memorable. It's, it still is. I mean, I guess it's in the top five of uh, opening rock and roll licks. And uh, so we got in the studio and it just sounded great. And so we, we worked on uh, refining it by getting uh, three gospel singers from Oakland and uh, adding more instruments. And there, there, there we went. And we, when we listened back to the final mix, I mean, we had shivers. It sounded so good. And Warner Brothers said, oh, yeah, so we'll, we'll do this. And the rest is history. And at the time, were you able to make a deal where you collected all the royalties for, for conjuring up that magic? Well, no. Uh, I was signed to Warner Brothers as an artist. And so I got artist royalties. In those days, it was quite small. And uh, basically, there wasn't much money to make because you had to pay back studio costs and, 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 and promotion things that they, they charged to your account. And, but that's the way it worked back then. Uh, we weren't necessarily cheated. It was just the way it worked. It was the system. The publishing side, because he signed me to a production deal. It went through his, uh, Eric Jacobson's publishing company. But as a writer, I got half uh, being with a BMI uh, as opposed to ASCAP. Right. Right. And, and so, you know, I, I got my share of royalties and I wasn't cheated. And I would imagine you've been able to live off the royalties from that song and still continue to do so. Well, uh, there, were, there was a time and, and, and his production deal with them changed and uh, he was real good at business. So uh, uh, he became the owner of the master after so many years from Warner Brothers. His deal was, uh, you can have it for this many years, and then I assume uh, ownership right. of it. So mm -hmm. my royalties went way up, they like quad, you know, went up a lot. Right. And so that's when I started to make money. And that wasn't until, you know, the, the, the late 80s, oh. uh, middle 90s. And there when it started to be used a lot. And so uh, that was good for me. And yeah, I mean, it's been in uh, to his 65 movies and over a couple dozen uh, commercials on TV. And uh, it's been part of Hello Benita. It's lovely. <laughs> Stay here with and, us, Benita. Uh, it's been used in a lot of TV shows. And uh, it's it gets a major play on oldie stations to this day. And it, it's uh, it, it's been remarkable, really. Who, who knew, as they say, that uh, a song could last that long, yet sound that good that much later because the production was just so good 
and it, and it just still has it. Yeah. So, so you, yeah, I'm real happy. Yeah, I, and, and well, you should be. So you said that you'd been working on the musical side of it for some time. That actually took a while for you to develop. Uh, how do you mean? On the on the on the on the music as opposed to the lyrics. So writing. Oh the no, tune, it, yeah? was just, it was just back then. Uh, well, sometimes when you write, you come up with the lyrics first, and or the, the music first. And somehow, you know, I would I would do lyrics mostly first, and then put music to it. I did both. On this particular one, it, it wasn't that way. I just didn't know what to do with the music. I didn't want it to sound like anything else. And uh, I'd just been fooling around with it for years. And so it just was, you know, boom, that's it. <laughs> How fantastic. It was, it was a good thought at the time. It did yeah. everything. Um, uh, how amazing that something like that could just set you up for the rest of your life and still be here 50 years, more than 50 years later. It's incredible. Yeah, well, it set me up to be known. Uh, there was some very, there was a long, there were, there were a lot of struggling years because I never could get a big enough hit after. And they weren't especially flops, but they didn't hit the top five. And uh, so I reached a point where all my deals uh, expired. And so I uh, moved back to LA and, and went through different management and did a bunch of demos. And uh, then part of that time I had another band uh, back here. I kept going back and forth from Northern California to Southern California, but we just couldn't make it happen. And one of the reasons that, that I was told was whatever I was doing, it just wasn't spirit in the sky. So in a, had, in a way, it was like it was kind of like being an actor and being typecast. You couldn't move out of that. You were sort of typecast in spirit of the sky. It was. And it was very frustrating. And uh I eventually, in the early 80s, said, well, I got to do something else. Yeah. And and what did you do then? I, I became a chef. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Did things. you teach yourself how to do that too? I was really, I was really a kitchen manager. And uh, it wasn't like an upscale fine restaurant. It was, it, it was American food. But I was real good at it, and uh, but I did mostly a, a, after a while for, uh, cooking. Uh, I, I just managed the back, did all the purchasing, as they call it, a restaurant manager. How did how did how did that sit with you mentally? I mean, I can see on the wall behind you gold records and and uh, and clippings from newspapers and the like. How did that? apparent come down or change in, in your life? How did that sit with you? Well, there wasn't a lot going on with the music at that time. And uh, they hadn't started to use it in, in commercials or, 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 or movies. So uh, I was disappointed, but I, you know, I got past it. Uh, I, had a, I had my time. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people are famous for one hit and waited time out until people wanted oldies again and then put the band back together or just got other players and to, to now uh, they're on they're on oldies tours yeah well everything old is new again that's for sure and as you started off by saying at this at the head of this interview that had COVID not come you would have been one of those oldies on tour currently yes we had it all set up and uh, unfortunately, this happened. But there's always next year that will come back and God willing, good health, you, you'll be able to get out there again and do it. Norman, I'm just curious though, with your um, background and upbringing, and I imagine all your um, Jewish friends from your teenage years, um, how did they react? Well, what sort of reaction did you get generally from your family and friends from from all those well, gospel my words. family I didn't understand it, of course, and but uh, when it became a hit, 
uh, how could they how could they put me down? <laughs> fair, fair enough. And do you still uphold some of the Jewish traditions today? You do the the uh, Yom Tovs? No. You've le you left it completely. Well, I, I still remember some words, and we do Hanukkah. Ah. That's about it. Not Pesach and not not Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, none of those. No, we we don't have room for too many, that many dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Very cute. So, um, but I still eat hamburgers without cheese. <laughs> well, and one of the songs that you wrote was called in fact canned ham, wasn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. That one has a pretty interesting story. Uh, back, uh, my ex-wife and I were shopping at the grocery store and the person in front of us in line had one of those big five pound canned hams. And in May, there's all kinds of crazies in my head. I just looked at it and I said, when are you gonna buy me a canned ham? And I went, oh my God, I got a song going here. <laughs> so uh, it wasn't especially a follow up uh, to Spirit in the Sky, it was another song. And uh, a lot of people liked it. It didn't do as well as Spirit in the Sky, but we still play it. Nothing and, could have done as well as Spirit in the Sky. And, they and, just and actually, uh, we do quite a, and we do a little funny thing with us. Oh, not so funny, it's, it's kind of cool. Uh, when we do that song, we bring a bunch of one pound canned hams with us. And I autograph them and give them to a few people. Oh, that's front. cool. But I mean, when you said it didn't do as well as Spirit in the Sky, nothing could have done as well as Spirit in the Sky. It just exploded. How well exactly did that song do? Well, back then, they usually measured things by singles, and it, and it sold over 2 million. And, and it was number one or in the top five all over the world. Uh, name a country. It, it was a big hit. Um, interesting enough, uh, in, in, uh, it was, in the 80s, a band from England called Dr. West and the Medics, I mean, uh, Dr. and the Medics, his, his wife's last name was West. Wow. We, we, we correspond. So his Dr. and the Medics did, did a version of it in England, and he got it to be number one in England and all over Europe. So it was number one again there. And a few years after that, uh, a singer named Gareth Gates, who decided to record it, and he be, he got to number one in England. So it's been number one in England three times, which is a pretty good accomplishment for the song. That's amazing. Well, congratulations on it and, and all your accomplishments. Um, everyone, of course, knows Norman Greenbaum for Spirit in the Sky, and, and I'm really happy that you're happy about that. If everybody got a chance to have as big a hit as you have, it'd be a, a very happy world. It would. Uh, I'm going to definitely ask my people to send me to Australia. <laughs>